بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد after so many breaks that were unexpected uh, because of the cold front and whatnot inshallah we are finally alhamdulillah coming back I think after one month how long has it been uh, more than a month like one month one month four weeks break I think right we had so uh, the what mashallah so it is a four week break now we're coming back after that. This is the fifth week, to be very pedantic about it. So, alhamdulillah. So, a four week break, as I said, alhamdulillah. Uh, and we are now resuming um, our uh, session. And uh, some people have suggested I should not call this seerah anymore. And this is a valid point because, of course, the seerah is now over. Nonetheless, uh, what we're discussing today is related to the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it is of course the election of the uh, Khalifa Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an and as every single Muslim is very intimately aware this is where the theological divide begins between Sunnism and Shiism this is really where it all begins so today's lecture is not just historical it is also theological Today's lecture is not just historical, it is also theological because uh, we believe, and this is a, the difference between Sunnism and Shiism, we believe that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was the person who was the most suitable to be the Khalifa and this is a religious matter and not just a political matter and of course the other group disagrees with this. So the question arises and so today we're going to do a little bit about this issue. It's not going to be that detailed because this is not a class of Sunnism versus Shiism and I'm not going to give you the Shi'i evidences why not. That's a separate class. I have spoken about this in other seminars not in this historical but you cannot talk about the election of Abu Bakr without at least giving some indications of the theological differences as well. So the question that arises is, how was Abu Bakr as-Siddiq chosen? What was the methodology of his choosing? Uh, there are three uh, opinions, if you like, about this issue within Sunni Islam. The first of them is that uh, the Sahaba amongst themselves decided to choose Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. There's nothing from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whatsoever. And this, some have said this is the majority opinion. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah also seems to, some in some writings, lean to this opinion. That the Sahaba amongst themselves thought and talked and then they chose Abu Bakr. The second opinion, and this is uh, narrated from Al-Hasan al-Basri and others, is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam indirectly indicated that Abu Bakr should be the Khalifa, indirectly indicated, not directly, and neither was there nothing, which is the first opinion. And, uh, well, let me be precise, the first opinion does not say there was nothing. The first opinion says, no doubt the Prophet ﷺ said that Abu Bakr was the best in terms of his fadl, in terms of his status. But the first opinion would say the Prophet ﷺ did not indicate who should be the political leader after him, right? All of Sunni Islam agrees that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq is the best Sahabi amongst all of the Sahaba, right? So the difference comes, how was he chosen to be the Khalifa? Some group will say, the Sahaba realized he was the best, so they chose him to be the Khalifa. The second opinion says, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam subtly indicated that he should be the Khalifa. And al Hassan al-Basri and others uh, uh, held this position, that there's nothing explicit, but neither is it neutral. Rather, there's hints, isharat, that Abu Bakr should be the Khalifa. And the third opinion is what's left now. The Prophet clearly said. And this opinion has also been hinted at by some of the early authorities, and it is also the position of the famous Andalusian scholar Ibn Hazm. Ibn Hazm said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explicitly commanded the Sahaba. It's a command, right? And this is in exact contradistinction to the Shi'i uh, theology, which is that he commanded Ali to be the Khalifa. That's the Shi'i theology. And Ibn Hazm and others say, no, the exact opposite. He commanded Abu Bakr to be the Khalifa. Right? And this is a minority opinion. Minority opinion, and frankly, uh, I did some research today, I could not find another name other than Ibn Hazm. It has been narrated, you find it, that some people said, who are these people? 
I could not find anybody other than Ibn Hazm. Maybe there are other people that are saying this is a very small minority opinion that the Prophet explicitly commanded the Sahaba that, for example, when I die, the Khalifa should be Abu Bakr as Siddiq. This is not the majority opinion. The majority opinion is between one and two. The majority opinion is between one and two. And frankly, the two opinions are not mutually exclusive, one and two. One and two are not mutually exclusive. Is that clear? In other words, both of them are valid. Because the first group, what is it saying? They, the first group is saying that the ahadith about Abu Bakr just mention how great of a person he is. And he's the greatest. But then isn't that an indication as well that, that he should be the leader? right? So therefore, in my opinion, really the first and the second opinions are really the same opinion. Which is that the Prophet ﷺ did not explicitly say Abu Bakr should be the Khalifa. But there were enough indications that the Sahaba therefore understood who should be the Khalifa. So you can kind of combine between the two opinions and make it into one opinion. And Allah Azza wa knows best. And interestingly enough, as time went by, many ulama and many scholars of tafsir and many theologians attempted to derive Quranic evidences for the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, believe it or not. They attempted to derive Quranic evidences for the Khilafah of Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu an. So much so that the famous uh, Shanqiti, who is the uh, author of Adwa al Bayan, he actually derived a little bit of a advanced, advanced. Uh, uh, convoluted uh, evidence from Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. From the first verse of the Quran, he kept on going, 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 till he basically got to the conclusion that, and this verse also indicates the Khilafah of Abu Bakr. So, I mean, there are all of these things, but there are some verses that are perhaps a little bit, perhaps more indicative than others. Uh, of them, of course, is the verse that talks about Abu Bakr. What is the verse that talks about Abu Bakr? He is the what? Second in the cave, right? Thani athnaini idhuma filgar. Okay? Thani athnaini idhuma filgar. So, what is the, how, how can this be used to derive Abu Bakr should be the Khalifa? So, they say, if he is the second of the two, then when the first one is missing, who is left? Abu Bakr. Right? So, Allah says he is the second of the two. So, logically speaking, when the first is not there, the second must come and stand in his place. Right? So, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly calls him Thani Athnain, this indicates, therefore, that when the number one is not there and is missing, uh, passed away, number two will take that place. And frankly, that's not a bad evidence. Okay? It's actually somewhat of a good evidence here. That when Allah says Abu Bakr is the second of the two, therefore, when number one is not there, number two then gets into the place. And in fact, linguistically, what does Khalifa mean linguistically? Khalifa means the one who has been appointed to be in charge of. So, khal Khalifa means to take over when the person leaves. So, when somebody leaves, then the Khalifa comes. So, when Allah says Abu Bakr is Thani Athnain, then in fact, this makes him kind of the Khalifa. Because Khalifa means when the one goes, so the number two uh, comes in. Therefore, this is one opinion. Sorry, one ayah. Another ayah that is used is Surah at tawbah verse 100. Where Allah says, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ تَبَعُهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ And those who are السَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ The earliest who raced to convert to Islam from the Muhajirun and the Ansar and those who came after them. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically indicating that the earliest converts are the best and they are in order after the Prophet So after the Prophet who do you have? As-sabiqoon al-awwaloon min al-muhajirin wal-ansar The earliest of the batches who raced from and then even there's a tartib, Muhajirun then Ansar. So who is the first adult convert of the Muhajirun? Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore is also indicating according to this interpretation that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq should be, uh, should be uh, in, in charge after the Prophet Islam. Now these are the two verses that in my opinion have at least, in my opinion, some, it makes some sense. There are at least seven, eight others that are given that 
frankly, I don't find much substance in it. It seems more imaginative, such as Alhamdulillah Bil Alameen. He goes through here and there until he gets this. I don't see this as being direct. Uh, but these two, I think, they have some semblance of authenticity that yes, indeed, the Quran is praising Abu Bakr indirectly or directly in the first verse. And from this you can somewhat extract the theological point that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq is the most qualified. Okay, So the Quran does seem to have some indication. As for the ahadith, there are so many ahadith about the blessings of Abu Bakr. We can give an entire lecture or two just about those ahadith. But I just want to mention three or four that indicate that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq uh, clearly has a status that the other Sahaba do not have even when it comes to issues of standing instead of or in place of the Prophet i.e. the Khalifa of the Prophet because again what does Khalifa mean? Khalifa means you're standing in place of somebody else so what are some of these ahadith? of the most uh, authentic of and the most explicit is a hadith in Sahih Bukhari itself that the Prophet is seeing a dream so he is predicting the future by seeing this dream. And he is saying, while I was sleeping, I saw in a dream that I was standing next to a well. And I pulled from this well as long as Allah will that I pull. So he is now pulling water. Then Abu Bakr came and he pulled a bucket or two. And in his pulling was some weakness. It wasn't as strong as mine. There was some weakness in it. Then Umar ibn al-Khattab came. And the bucket became a, and, and the Arabic word is used, which uh, basically means a much larger. So they have different, in English we have bucket. We say small bucket, medium bucket, large bucket. In Arabic, obviously, when you're drawing water from a well, you have so many different nouns to describe the size of the bucket. And the first word used is dalu. And dalu is basically a small canister. Then the next word is used, Umar came, and it became basically the much bigger bucket. The much bigger one that is used for watering uh, camels or something. And so it transformed to this one. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I have never seen an abqari like Umar working with the bucket uh, like anybody else. And Abqari, of course, uh, in modern Arabic means genius. But in classical Arabic, it meant something above and beyond what is natural. Supernatural. Or uh, above normal. So the Prophet some called, by the way, for the Arabs here, the Prophet some called Umar an Abqari. Okay? He called Umar an Abqari. And Abqari means more than regular. Okay, more than what not. So, uh, the Prophet said, I, I never saw anyone like Umar, in the dream obviously, pulling the water out of the uh, well, so much so that the people returned with their camels to the camel pens, end of hadith, meaning so much water was given. Not only did the people drink, the camels drank. And they drank all the way to their full, and the camels then went back to go to sleep. Okay, so this hadith is in Bukhari. And the symbolism is obvious, it's beautiful, it's profound, it's obvious. The Prophet is saying that after I went away, after I left, Abu Bakr took over and he continued my job for a year or two. Because he was only there for a year or two. For a bucket or two, right? For a year or two he continued and there was some jerkiness, some, it wasn't as smooth. Why? Not, it's not Abu Bakr's fault. Things happen in his Khilafah that it wasn't as smooth because what happened in his Khilafah? Hurub al Ridda. The whole Ummah fractured up, right? The Ummah was about to collapse and Allah saved it through Abu Bakr. So this is now, it wasn't as smooth. It's not that Abu Bakr is problematic, it's that there are things happening, but he manages to continue the flow. No matter what happened, he's still continuing the flow. And this is what we believe that Abu Bakr as Siddiq salvaged. By the blessings of Allah, he, he healed the wounded Ummah. And were it not for Allah and then Allah's choosing of Abu Bakr, the Ummah would have splintered up and that's it. Islam would not be what it is today. So Abu Bakr managed to continue and he was needed for Umar to come. Because if Umar had come at that time and he tried to do it that fast, it would have broken. The rope would have broken. 
wouldn't have lasted. You needed Abu Bakr to just continue the flow. Once the flow is back to normal, Umar comes in and then he takes the flow and he turns it into a river basically. Right? Now, hadith doesn't say river, by the way. Don't misunderstand me. I'm just trying to say the hadith says that the small bucket becomes the massive bucket. And everybody and even their camels drink. Meaning what? What's the symbolism here? The conquest of the ummah. And it is amazing in our 14 centuries of Khilafah, 14 centuries of Islamic history, the conquests of Umar remain unparalleled. I mean, honestly, think about it. When our technology, our money, our weapon was nothing, Umar ibn Khattab's time, he managed to do what no other Khalifa has ever done. And it is really mind-boggling if you understand history and whatnot, and you understand the status, the military status of the Arabs versus the military status of the Romans and the Persians to completely decimate the Sassanid Persian Empire, wipe it off the map of history. The Roman Empire could not harm the Persian Empire for 350 years. In fact, the Persian Empire usually was stronger than the Roman Empire. And yet here comes a bunch of Arabs, uneducated, could not read and write, they don't have weapons, they don't have military training, they don't even have the horses and the regiments that the other troops have. They don't have the armor, they don't have the... nothing is there. And for them to come out of nowhere and completely wipe off the Persians from the face of this earth. As if they never existed. Wallahi, to this day historians are scratching their heads. Like, how could we explain this? And of course they have their theories, but of course we know the real story. And that is that he tore the letter up of the Prophet And the Prophet said, Allah will tear your kingdom up like you tore my letter up. And that's exactly what happened. Barely 10 years after the Prophet said this. Khalas, their kingdom was gone on the hands of Umar al-Khattab. And the Roman Empire, around half of it was carved up. The jewel of the Roman Empire, Damascus. For us, Damascus is associated with, of course, the Umayyads and the, uh, and the Muslims. Realize, before Umar conquered it, Damascus was the jewel of the Roman Empire. It was on the, on the route of the Silk Road. The Silk Road pretty much ended in Damascus, starting in China all the way to Damascus, and then it moved on to the other lands. This was one of the most important cities of the Roman civilization. And of course, Bilad the Sham, Jerusalem, all of this. And it was of course in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab that all of this was conquered. And so all of this conquering, this is the well becoming that river, and everybody's drinking. The water is so much, the power, the izzah is just coming everywhere. And the ummah is still benefiting to this day from the conquests of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So this dream clearly indicates, what does it indicate? That when I leave, Abu Bakr will take charge. When Abu Bakr leaves, Umar will take charge. Okay? Even though the hadith does not mention the khilafah, but it is understood. Other hadith, also in Sahih Bukhari, also in Sahih Bukhari, a woman came asking for some money, some help, some financial aid. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I don't have anything now, but come back on such and such a time, you'll get it. So basically nothing now, but come back and I promise you, you'll have it. So the lady is desperate, she wants the money. She says, Ya Rasulullah, what if I come back and you're not here? Meaning, what if I don't find you? She didn't mean if you're dead. She meant, what if you're not here? What should I do then? So the Prophet ﷺ said, if you do not find me, then go to Abu Bakr. Of course, the context of the hadith is one thing. But the wording is much broader. And Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar comments on this hadith. And he said, this is an evidence that the khilafah, was to be given to Abu Bakr after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. If you do not find me, then go to Abu Bakr. Now the context indicates, or the context tells us this is about money, the woman wants money, what if she can't find the Prophet ﷺ? The Prophet said, go find Abu Bakr, he'll give you the money. That's the context. But the wording is so broad that the Prophet ﷺ is saying, in any case you do not find me, there is a person that will 
do what I want him to do, and that is Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And therefore, this is another hadith as well. And there is yet, an, and this is in Bukhari as well. And there is yet another uh, hadith as well that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in Sunan al-Tirmidhi. He said, "Iqtadu bil ladaini min ba'di Abu Bakr wa Umar." Follow those who will come after me, Abu Bakr and Umar. So he mentioned two by name. Follow those who will come after me, Abu Bakr and Umar. And this hadith is in uh, Tirmidhi. And there's also the famous hadith in Sahih Muslim that Abu Huraira uh, was sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and uh, in the garden, and uh, the the, uh, the the there was a knock on the door, and in one version it's Bilal, one version is Abu Huraira, and uh, the Prophet said, "Go see who it is, uh, and then whoever it is, tell him that." Allah gives him glad tidings of Jannah. So it does Abu Bakr, and then Umar, and then Uthman. And each one is the same thing. And then when is Uthman, the Prophet ﷺ said to tell either Bilal or Abu Huraira, go tell Uthman that he will get Jannah after some problems he'll face in this world. Some issues he'll face, but he'll then get to uh, Jannah. So again, you have this indication, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman. All three, one after the other. This hadith is in Sahih Muslim. It's another prediction. And this is also when it is narrated that the process was sitting in the well. And he was sitting with his feet inside the well. Abu Bakr came, Umar came, and the well is now full. So Uthman could not find place to sit on the well. He sat behind them. Okay, so once again, there's an indication that the time of glory really will be Abu Bakr and Umar's time. Uthman will have some issues, which is what happened in his time of the fitna uh, and the, the, the beginnings of the fitna in his time. And uh, we also have the hadith in Sunan Abi Dawood, where the Prophet ﷺ, after Fajr, he would ask the Sahaba, have any of you seen any dream? So one of the Sahaba said, I saw a dream last night. He said, and this is a dream from a Sahabi, not a dream from the Prophet ﷺ. But the fact that it was said to the Prophet ﷺ in his presence, and he was silent, indicates that this is a dream from Allah. Is that clear? Because a part of the hadith and a part of the sunnah is whatever is said to the Prophet ﷺ or done in his presence, it automatically gets, becomes a hadith, as long as he's quiet about it. So the Sahabi said that I saw a dream that a mizan, the scales came down from the heavens. And you, Ya Rasulullah, were weighed against Abu Bakr. And you were heavier than Abu Bakr. Then Abu Bakr was weighed against Umar. And Abu Bakr was heavier than Umar. Then Umar was weighed against Uthman. And Umar was heavier than Uthman. Then the Mizan was lifted up. Now this hadith once again indicates specific tartib, specific order. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman. And that is exactly what happened. So this is also a prediction. And all of these are indirect indications. Uh, and of course, for uh, Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, for Sunni Islam, the strongest indication that Abu Bakr should be the Khalifa is in fact what? The Salah that the Prophet commanded him to lead when he was sick for how many days? Remind me. How many days? Three days and nights. When the Prophet was alive, on his deathbed, Abu Bakr as Siddiq was commanded to lead the Salah. And so much so that when Umar when the first time came, the Prophet on his deathbed, sweating, feverish, barely conscious, in and out of consciousness, he became irritated with Aisha and others, and he said, Stop him and get Abu Bakr. For Allah and His Messenger will not allow anybody other than Abu Bakr. This is a very strict, this is not just who's going to be the Imam. Because had that been the case, what's wrong with anybody leading? But there's an indication wanting to be given. I want to demonstrate for you something. And that is who is going to be in charge after me. And the hadith is very explicit. فَيَأْبَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ إِلَّا أَبَا بَكَرُ Allah and His Messenger refuse to have anybody stand there other than Abu Bakr. So Umar ibn Khattab, as we know, he had to break the salah. Because the Prophet commanded it. And Abu Bakr has to be called. And then Abu Bakr leads the salah for three days and nights. And as well, uh, in the last khutbah that he gave, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sitting on the mimbar, uh, what did he say? Close all of the doors of the masjid other than the door of Abu Bakr. The khawqa is the, the, the narrow alleyways that would come in, as I told you many times, and I showed, the, showed you the diagram on the, on the TV screen, that the masajid 
and the houses were connected with a small alleyway and whatnot. And those Sahaba that had built their houses around the masjid, there's direct access to the masjid. And at the death of the Prophet ﷺ, he commanded, that's it, no more direct access. You enter with the common door. Those of you whose houses are next, enter in the common door, except one man gets the blessing to enter from his house straight to the masjid. And that is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And this is the last khutbah that he gave on the mimbar. Uh, sitting down, he couldn't stand up. And in that khutbah he said that a person has been given the choice between this world and the next, right? That's the khutbah there. In that khutbah he mentions, close all doors other than the door of Abu Bakr. So we have so many evidences. That Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was the one whom uh, the Prophet ﷺ wanted to. Now the question arises, why didn't then the Prophet ﷺ simply say, when I die, Abu Bakr should be the Khalifa. And to this there are many responses. The strongest one, and Allah knows best, is he, he alayhi wasallam, did not want to open the precedent or the door that every Khalifa must decide the next Khalifa. He didn't want to have this as the political philosophy. It's open. If the Khalifa wants to decide, it is allowed. But if the Prophet ﷺ had done it, it would have become wajib. And that is why if you look at the four Khulafa, each one of them did something different. Abu Bakr specified the next person is going to be Umar. But Abu Bakr doing it doesn't make it wajib. Umar specified a group. These are six people. Choose amongst them. Correct? Uthman radiallahu anhu, nothing happened. He didn't specify anybody. There was a bit of a chaos. The people then chose Ali radiallahu anhu, right? So each one of them did something different. And the Sharia allows for all of this. And the one that is the uh, least encouraged is to specify your son. This is not encouraged at all. It does not invalidate the caliphate, as some extreme people say. If that were the case, then we would never have had a caliphate since the time of the Abbasids, which means we only had a caliphate for 30 years. N nobody with sense on his mind says that. But it is not ideal. And it is definitely not the best. And Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, for a maslaha that he saw, for an ijtihad that he saw, he thought it was best to nominate his son. And so, the last of the... Sahaba who was the Khalifa and that's Muawiyah opened this door and Muawiyah's blessing is not like the blessing of Abu Bakr and his ishtihad is not like the ishtihad of Abu Bakr yes it is halal yes it is jaiz but it is definitely not the best to do and so Allah allowed the last of the Sahaba who was the Khalifa to open this door to indicate that it's not invalid if there's a dynasty and the majority of the ummah has been upon a dynasty. But the ideal, which is Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, each one was done in a different manner. But the Prophet ﷺ did not want to open this door. He wanted to leave it open. And therefore, he indicated without specifying, right? Without being too verbal. This is the, what, the, the wisdom that most of our scholars say. In any case, returning back to our story after this long introduction, what exactly happened on that day? So remind me again, when did the Prophet ﷺ pass away? Monday morning, very good. Date? Rab last? 12th. 12th Rabi'il Awwal. I thought you said last. Okay. 12th Rabi'il Awwal. Awwal. So he passed away on a Monday, early morning, after Fajr prayer, early morning, on the 12th of Rabi'il Awwal. And. Uh, that I do not know actually. I'll have to look that up. I do not know. And we'll have to look up other sources. So on the morning of the 12th, within a few hours, the same day on Monday, the Ansar began, began to gather at their usual gathering place. What was their usual gathering place? Their usual gathering place was a type of shack, a type of, uh, if you like, a shed. And that in Arabic is called Saqifa. Saqifa is a covering or a shed. Something that's just covering up. And this shed or this Saqifa was in a garden. And the garden belonged to the most famous of the Khazraj tribes. Which is the Banu Sa'ada. Which is what uh, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah belonged to. 
And this was the, the usual gathering place from the days of Jahiliyyah. From before Islam, they had a gathering place. You know, it was the, the culture of the Arabs that there's a gathering place. So within a few hours of the death of the Prophet everybody's coming and the Ansar began to gather. And of course, the conversation gets to what's going to happen now. It is very important to note, the Ansar did not send an announcement, come, let us discuss the Khilafah. No. Rather, it's human nature that at times of a joint calamity, right, you want to go and meet. At times of individual calamity, you go and meet the person. Somebody's relative dies, you go and meet that person. Or you go, you go to the family. In a joint calamity, something of this nature, you want to find out what's happening, you go and talk. So it's human nature. And especially in that culture, that when anything major happened, the man would go to these types of these types of gatherings. So the Ansar all began to trickle in to the Saqifa of Banu Sa'ida. And of course, uh, Banu Sa'ida's Saqifa is well known in Medina. I have shown it to you all the time. We have gone for Umrah. Uh, it is on the back of the Masjid of Nabawi. If you're facing the Qibla, on the back right hand side, there is still an actual garden. Right? The northwestern side. It is still an actual garden. And that garden is the Saqifa of Banu Sa'ida. It is still there to this day. Uh, and uh, you can see it clearly when we stay to the groups that we go with. Uh, and you need to go in our group, inshallah, this year. Uh, when we go uh, in our groups, we always stay in the hotel right behind the Saqifa. All of the blocks of hotels, right? It is on the back side. And the rightmost hotel, when you exit, you will find the garden in front of you. That is the Saqifa of Banu Sa'ida. So uh, the Ansar began to gather. Now, again, I want to point out. There is no maliciousness that let us talk about the Khilafah. But what is going to happen when all of the men are gathered and the process has passed away, eventually the conversation gets to what's going to happen now? Who's going to take charge? Because everybody understands you need a leader. You cannot live without a leader. You need somebody in charge. And so eventually this conversation uh, ensues. And the main person that they looked up to and whose name continually came up was their senior most figure at the time. And that is Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was the senior most leader of the Khazraj. And of course the Khazraj and the Aus, the two of the Ansari tribes, the Khazraj were the larger of the two. Remember. I had said this, I think, two or three years ago. So I'm sure all of you remember everything I ever said. So no problem, inshallah. So the Khazraj was the larger of the two tribes. Okay. And which, which was the richer of the two? The Aus was the richer of the two. But the Khazraj was the larger of the two. So quantity counts here. And so uh, amongst the Khazraj, another blessing the Khazraj had was that the Khazraj were the ones who first embraced Islam and then the Aus embraced Islam. So the first bay'at al-aqaba, the first group who converted when the Prophet gave da'wah, excuse me, the first group, remember the Prophet passed them by and he said, which tribe are you? They said, the Khazraj. There was no Aus in the first converts from Medina. So because of this, the quantity and the earliness, so the Khazraj have an upgrade status. So therefore, the Khazraj began talking amongst themselves and Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, his name was basically understood that he is our leader. If anybody is going to be a leader from the Ansar, it's going to be Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Now, pause here. Who is Sa'ad ibn Ubadah? We need to understand before we move on. Firstly, re remember that there are two famous Sa'ads of the Ansar. Two famous Sa'ads of the Ansar. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh and Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. And of the two, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh is much higher in daraja than Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, and the both of them are blessed. But of the two, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh is much higher. Not only did he convert first, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, he was the one who spoke at the Battle of Badr, which was one of the greatest blessings of any Ansari. Who was the Ansari who upgraded the pledge from mere protection to offensive fighting? That is Sa'ad ibn Ubad, sorry, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, excuse me, the other Sa'ad, not our Sa'ad. Are you guys remembering what happened at Badr? You all remember what happened at Badr, right? When the Prophet said, what do you guys think? And Abu Bakr stood up, Umar stood up, everybody stood up. He kept on saying, what do you guys think? What do you guys think? Until finally, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, not Ubadah, stood up and said, 
Perhaps you're wanting to know our answer. That's why you keep on asking, Ya Rasulullah. He said, yes, that is it. So then he gave that beautiful, eloquent speech, which concluded in, go charge in the water, Ya Rasulullah. We will charge behind you. And we will not say to you like the Bani Israel said to Musa, go and fight you and your Lord. No, we will say, go and fight you and your Lord. And we are right behind you fighting along with you. That is Sa'd ibn Mu'adh. And when did he die? After the battle of the Khandaq. And when he passed away, the Prophet ﷺ said, the throne of Allah shook at the death of Sa'd ibn Mu'adh. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, 70,000 angels came to take the soul of Sa'd ibn Mu'adh. Uh, and the Prophet ﷺ himself prayed janazah for Sa'd ibn Mu'adh and expressed a lot of dismay and regret at his, uh, at his death. That is Sa'd ibn Mu'adh. And he is, of course, no longer alive. He's gone in the seerah. Okay, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was the second of the two Sa'ads. And this is the one we are talking about now. And Sa'ad ibn Ubadah also has a long list of resume of, of great things, but not like Sa'ad Sa ibn Mu'ad. Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad is, as we said, much higher. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, he was of those who participated in the second treaty of Aqaba. Not the first, by the way, the second. The second treaty of Aqaba. The second treaty which had 72, right? And he was one of those who was chosen to represent his sub-tribe. So he's one of the 12 Nuqaba who are the chosen. So Sa'ad ibn Ubadah is therefore one of the elite of Aqaba. And he participated in every single battle from Badr. And so he's a Badri. So automatically when you're a Badri, you get a huge upgrade. So Sa'ad ibn Ubadah is from the uh, Badr. He was also of the uh, wealthier of the Ansar because of his father and grandfather. They were somewhat chieftain statuses. And so he has inherited money and inherited generosity as well. Both his father and grandfather in the days of Jahiliyyah were known for their hospitality. And he inherited this from them. It is said that he would regularly feed most of the people of the Sufa. Uh, Ibn Hajar mentions that on days when somebody would take one or two or three, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah would take 80 of the people of the Sufa to his house to feed them. So Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was of those who had huge heart, very generous person, always feeding uh, the poor. And many are the things narrated about him in the famous uh, hadith when the Prophet came to the house of Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. So this shows you his status, that the Prophet for some reason, he wants to speak about the Khazr or something, he goes to the house of Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. And uh, from outside of the house he said Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh That's what you do, there is no ringer, there is no bell How do you say Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh So Sa'ad is so happy to hear the dua He whispers back Wa alaikum salam Very whispering, right? And the Prophet is outside, he doesn't hear So he raises his voice for the second time and he says it And Sa'ad whis whispers back Then the Prophet raises his voice and for the third time and Sa'ad whispers back, what are you supposed to do after the third time? Leave. So, so the Prophet left. When Sa'ad heard the footsteps, he goes running outside. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I heard you the first and second and third time. And I responded to you. But I wanted to hear your du'as over and over again. So, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When the Prophet is saying, Assalamu alaikum, you want more. Okay? So Sa'ad wanted to hear the salams. So he keeps on saying, I, I responded, Ya Rasulullah, but... Not that loud, so that you know, so you could keep on giving it to me, right? He didn't say it like that, but you get the point. That uh, he said, "Ya Rasulullah, I heard you outside. I responded, but uh, you know, come in." So this is Sa'ad ibn uh, Ubadah, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, and also uh, we also have an, in a number of a hadith that Ibn Abbas, for example, mentions that whenever the Prophet Sallallahu gave the flag to any uh, in, in in any army. He would always choose Sa'ad ibn Ubadah to carry the flags for the Ansar. And therefore, even in the conquest of Mecca, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was the one carrying the flag for the Ansar. So he himself was representing the Ansar in front of the Prophet So the flag of the Ansar was given to him by the hands of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also, uh, the, we have other hadith where the Prophet specifically mentioned by name, may Allah bless the Ansar, and especially may Allah bless Sa'ad ibn Ubadah from the Ansar. So Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, definitely he has a long resume of blessings and whatnot, and therefore it's understood that even the Ansar recognize who is Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. So, going back to our story, 
Therefore, when the news spreads that people are gathering together, somebody comes and Abu Bakr and Umar are still in the masjid. This is now, we don't know the exact timing, we're assuming this is now before Dhuhr time. Because the Prophet passes away early morning, maybe 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, very early morning. Uh, we don't know exactly when, but in a few hours the news spreads. Abu Bakr and Umar are in the main masjid and somebody comes and tells them that, do you know that uh, the Ansar are gathering together? And they are talking about the conversation has now gone to basically who is going to take charge. So Umar said, let us go to our brethren from the Ansar and discuss this matter with them. Let us go and discuss this matter with them. And of course Abu Bakr agreed. Now, um, here is where uh, we don't have any eyewitness report other than one. And that is from Umar radiallahu anhu himself. And therefore, there are many other details that nobody will ever tell us. We don't know what the details are. We only have one eyewitness who told us what happened, and that is Umar ibn Khattab himself. Uh, it is not at all unlikely that the Prophet, that, sorry, that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq went and chose a number of people to accompany him. We don't know this. All we know is a group of the Muhajirun. But who, how did they come about? How did that particular group come? I would theorize, and Allah knows best, that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq chose the right group to go with him. Because it's not a coincidence, in my humble opinion, that Umar ibn Khattab and Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn Jarrah just happened to be sitting. And three of the Ashara Mubashara are right there in that gathering. Rather, Abu Bakr must have chosen the delegation. And the senior most members are, of course, Umar ibn al-Khattab himself and Abu Ubaidah Amir ibn al-Jarrah. Now, uh, as for the issue of Ali and, and Zubayr ibn Awam and others, uh, from our perspective, Sunni perspective, the Prophet has just passed away. And clearly, somebody has to take charge of the inner household matters and of consoling the family, and of ghusl, and of, and there is no doubt that Ali radiallahu anhu is the person who is the most closest to the process in terms of blood and lineage from the men's side. And there's nothing about that that we have to be at all awkward or embarrassed about. Of course he's going to take charge of taking care of uh, the inner matters of the household of the Prophet of the ghusl of and so Abbas and Ali the uncle and the cousin and the son-in-law these are the two who took charge of the inner matters and that's understood and as Zubayr ibn Awam as well is of the cousins of the Sahaba so this is understood also from our perspective uh, and just a little bit and again this is a very deep thing and I, I don't personally see the point in going into a lot of detail these controversies between the Sunnah and the Shia have existed for 13 and a half centuries. And nothing I will say today will add or decrease these facts. And if anybody wants to study them, believe me, hundreds of books in every language imaginable has been written. The evidence is for the Sunni, the evidence is for the Shia, back and forth, each and everything, on and on and on. And we can't reinvent the wheel, this is all there. And I don't see much benefit in, in, in continually talking about this. But we as Sunni should know our history, just like they know their history, we should also know our history. From our perspective, Ali radiallahu anhu is now barely 30 years old in his early 30s. And Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman even are almost double his age. And it really does not make sense to take somebody with some experience at the expense of somebody who has three, four decades of experience. In other words, from our perspective, Ali radiallahu anhu became the Khalifa when he deserved to be the Khalifa. When he came to the right age and the maturity and whatnot, and that's when he became the Khalifa. At this stage and age, it was not even on their radar that somebody so young, and remember, Abu Bakr as Siddiq and others, they have known Ali since he was a child and a baby. And it is human nature that when somebody is that young and you've grown up with him, they're not going to be on the radar at this stage. Not only that, there has been the tragedy of the death of the Prophet and they're busy. So it's not as if there's an intentional conspiracy. From our perspective, it is ludicrous to assume there's a conspiracy. There is no conspiracy. Umar, uh, sorry, Ali radiallahu anh, 
became the Khalifa when he deserved to be the Khalifa. And that was when he came to that right age of maturity, when Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman have, have moved on, and then it was his turn, and we uh, admire and respect every blessing about him. In any case, back to our story, I said it is not unrealistic to theorize that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq went and chose the right people for the delegation. Who is going to go and talk about this issue? And on the way to the Saqifah, they met two of the Ansar, uh, and when these Ansaris found out where they were going, they expressed some worriedness, and they said, maybe you shouldn't go, it's best not to go. They're worried, maybe there's going to be a, a shouting match. There is no worry of physical violence, because that's not happened in the time of the Sahaba. But uh, Umar said, no, inshallah, we will go, and there will be benefit in our going. So Umar continued on, and remember, this is the only narration we have is from Umar himself. Umar is the only one who narrated the first person. He's there, he witnesses it. Unfortunately, we don't have any other narrations or else we could have had a lot more uh, details. And Umar narrated, I begin his narration directly. He said, when we got there, we found the Ansar had gathered in the Saqifa, and between them was a man wrapped up in a shawl. We said, who is this? They said, this is Sa'd uh, ibn Ubadah. He is sick with fever. So it just so happened that he was sick, so therefore he's wrapped up uh, and uh, shivering and whatnot. So he had a fever at the just a Qaddar Allah, it was at the time he had a fever. So after we had arrived, the delegation has arrived, you know, the, the trivial formalities are done. Then one of the Ansar stood up. And he said, after praising Allah, as to what follows, so we are the Ansarullah, Ansarullah, the helpers of Allah. And we are the vanguard of Islam. I, we're the ones who defended Islam. And you, O group of Muhajirun, are a group amongst us. And you came to us one by one, bit by bit, and joined us. Meaning in a very polite manner, very nice manner, there's no, in back and forth, there's no derogatory terms. But each group feels at this time more qualified. So the Ansar are saying, in terms of sheer quantity, you guys are minuscule. The Ansar are probably, probably two, three thousand. These are like the elite senior. As for beyond them, much more than this. And the Muhajirun are probably two, three hundred. Because again, I mean, who's gonna, we're talking about the Muhajirun from pre-conquest, obviously, right? After conquest, whatnot, there is no. So pre-conquest, those who are like the, the senior of the, of the Quraysh, it's probably one tenth of the Ansar. So the Ansar, from their perspective, from their perspective, they're saying, I mean, we are so large, you guys came one after the other, because how did the Muhajirun come? One, two, three, and then slowly you guys came. So it's pretty obvious that because we're so many, we should be the leader, and you are just one qawm from amongst us. You're like one mini tribe from amongst all of us. So they're looking at it from their perspective, and there's an element of truth from their uh, perspective. So when he's speaking like this, Umar says, so as he was speaking, I thought to myself, what would I say? I'm thinking to myself, what are my points I'm going to say? And when he fell silent, I was happy that I have all of my points listed. Khalas, he has his speech ready now. Okay? And I was going to say something, and I knew it would be a little bit harsh. And I knew Abu Bakr would find my statements a little bit harsh. When I was about to stand up, Abu Bakr pulled me down. And he said, stay put, O Umar. Ala rislik, stay put, O Umar. So Umar says, so I was scared to make him angry. So this is Umar, the only person that Umar is not wanting to make angry, said, I listened to him because I didn't want to make Abu Bakr angry. Then Abu Bakr stood up. And he praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and gave a, a, a lecture. And Umar is saying, by Allah, he was wiser and more gentle than I would have been. And there was not a single point that I had in my mind, except that Abu Bakr said it or better than it. Notice here Umar's humility. Umar is narrating this in his own khilafah, by the way. When Abu Bakr has passed away, Umar is telling us the story. It's a, a longer event, which um, I don't have time to tell you, but basically, very quickly, 
rumors began to spread in the time of Umar an, that Abu Bakr's Khilafah was simply a coincidence. It just happened that it wasn't thought out. And that if we had thought it out, somebody else should have been the Khalifa other than him. When Umar heard this, he became angry. He became incensed. And he called a meeting of all of the Sahaba. And then he told the story. So this story is what I'm narrating to you. Okay? So this is the first person. Now he's telling them. So he's praising Abu Bakr in this manner. That no matter what I had in my mind, Abu Bakr had something better than me. And he said every point that I had. And he said every hadith that we had heard about the praise of the Ansar. And of what he said was that the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, sorry, Abu Bakr is saying that, and I know for a fact that the Prophet ﷺ said, if all of mankind took one path and the Ansar took the other path, I would follow the path of the Ansar. So he is going on and on about the blessings of the Ansar. Look at the wisdom of Abu Bakr. You don't begin the speech by putting somebody down. You want to impress somebody, you want to change their mind? Well then, you show them, you respect them for who they are. This is the wisdom of Abu Bakr. And perhaps if Umar had done it, he would not have done all of this. He himself said that I had some harshness and I knew Abu Bakr would find my speech harsh. I knew that would happen, but he never spoke because Allah willed him not to speak. So Abu Bakr begins by praising the Ansar. Every hadith he can think of about praising the Ansar. Then he moves on and he says, and O Sa'ad, so he points direct to Sa'ad. I know that you were sitting right in front of the Prophet wasallam when he himself said, it is the Quraysh who shall lead this matter of ours. The righteous amongst them shall lead the righteous of mankind and the impious shall lead the impious of mankind. So he quoted a hadith that the Prophet is saying the leaders shall be from the Quraysh. And he pointed to Sa'ad who is the one contender, the one person that might people might. And he says, oh Sa'ad, you remember that day when he said the hadith, you were right there, I was there. And this is so beautiful because by pointing to Sa'ad and then quoting a hadith and then saying we were both there that day. How then can anybody go against this hadith? So he mentions a hadith that kind of solves the matter. It can't be from the Ansar. Then he gives, so after hadith he then brings logic. And he says, and you know, O, o Ansar, that the Arabs will not follow anybody other than the Quraysh. Meaning their jahiliyyah is still there in that regard. And you, O Ansar, you're not going to be accepted by the rest of the Arabs. Whereas the Qurashi, they will accept him. Because they are the best of the Arabs in lineage and in house. Meaning, in lineage, meaning in terms of Sharaf, they are the most honorable in the days of Jahiliyyah. And in terms of house, meaning Mecca, they have the most noblest of houses, meaning uh, Mecca. And therefore, the leaders should be from the Quraysh. At this, Sa'ad said, Sadaqta, you have spoken the truth. You are the leaders and we are the helpers. Antumul umara wa nahnul wuzara. So Sa'ad, and this shows his iman by the way. This shows his iman that when the evidence is presented, khalas, you're right, I can't. I, how can you argue with the hadith? So you are the leaders, we are the helpers. Sadaqta, you are the umara, you are the wuzara. Then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu held on to the hands of Umar and Abu Ubaidah. And here is my point here, and that is that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq clearly was planning this out to nominate these two. It's not just a coincidence that it so happened that these two people are sitting next to him. No, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq wanted these two people to be next to him. And he brought them with him to the Saqifa. Abu Bakr in his modesty did not want to be the Khalifa or he did not want to nominate himself. That's not the appropriate way. But he has in mind the next two best people and of the next two best people and that's of the Ashara Mubashara, of the ten who have been promised Jannah. So he picks up the hand of Umar and he picks up the hand of Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn Jarrah and he said, I have nominated these two. Whichever of these two you like, choose him. And this is also hikmah because when you give somebody an option, 
it makes it easier for him to choose, even though before you gave him the option, he wouldn't have chosen either of them. In other words, the Ansar, they weren't thinking of the Quraysh. They were thinking of themselves. And Abu Bakr did not say, oh, here's Umar, give him, because then they would feel they have to. Rather, he opens up the door, he says, you guys choose between these two matters. Okay, and this is again, I mean, wallahi, we find here wisdom of a leader. We find here true psychology of leadership in Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. That Allah blessed him with to understand how to control an ummah. That without any tension, nothing is actually, you know, I mean, astaghfirullah, there's no battle take, there's no swords being drawn. But still, humans are humans. And the sahaba are the sahaba. And power is power. And we say, and there's no harm in saying this, Yes, indeed, some of them might have desired this for halal reasons. You think you will do good for the ummah. This is no, no doubt about it. But who is the one who really should be chosen in this case? It is the one whom Allah Azza wa Jal desired, and that is Abu Bakr. And so when uh, he said this, Umar al Khattab is narrating the story, and he said that, I swear by Allah, this was the only paragraph of Abu Bakr's speech that I hated that he nominated me and Abu Ubaidah, and he said, it would be more beloved to me to be executed, as long as there was no sin involved that I had done, than to lead a group, or be a Khalifa of a group, in which Abu Bakr was present. In other words, I'd rather die than be in charge of Abu Bakr. I'm not qualified to do that. This is Umar speaking in his Khilafah to a group of people who said maybe Abu Bakr wasn't the best, maybe somebody else should have been the Khalifa. Umar is saying, I would rather have my head chopped off than be the Khalifa over Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. This is Umar is saying this in his own uh, Khilafah. So when Abu Bakr said this statement that choose one of these two, uh, one, of the Ansar, one of the Ansar then said, I have a solution. I will give you another solution. Why don't we have two Amirs? One from us and one from you. Minna Amir wa minkum Amir. Okay? So we're both going to be happy. But of course, you can't have two drivers and two captains on a ship. And so when he suggested this, a lot of lagat or raising of the voices. You know what happens when you're in any gathering. Obviously what happens, somebody says this, somebody says that, and so it's all chaos and confusion. And at this, Umar said, so I raised my voice. When everybody's voice is being raised, Umar has the loudest voice and the deepest voice. And he says, O Abu Bakr, stretch forth your hand. And Abu Bakr put his hand forward, and Umar then said, we shall give the bay'ah to you. And so Umar was the first person to nominate Abu Bakr and then give the bay'ah to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and then the Muhajirun and the Ansar followed. And therefore, this was how the matter was done. And uh, there are, and I have to be again, part of, part of my job in this series of lectures is to also tell you that which you might not have heard or that which might not be the rosy side of the picture. And I do this because you are aware. And there are plenty of narrations in various books that Sa'ad ibn Ubadah was not satisfied with this uh, matter. According to some reports, he said that you guys have forced me to do this. And the response was given to him, it is better that you are forced to remain with the jama'ah than we let you go and you cause firqa. And if this report is authentic, there's nothing wrong with that. Because it is not haram to have these types of feelings and emotions, to desire certain things that are not haram to desire. You can desire fame and money for halal reasons. And if Sa'ad ibn Ubadah wanted to be the Khalifa, he wanted it for good reasons. So there's nothing wrong with this. He thought he would do a good and better job. That is his prerogative. Now this is one report. Others... They, they, they say all of these reports are baseless and they're just fabrications. So that is also an opinion out there. Then there are clear-cut fabrications. We typically find them in pro-Shi'i sources. Okay, so there are historians that are Shi'i in nature or are quoting uh, Shi'i uh, narrators uh, such as Al-Baladhuri, uh, such as uh, the, the narrator Abu Mikhnaf Lut ibn Yahya. This narrator uh, 
is the one who, by the way, when we talked about when we talked about Karbala, the first Shi'i author to ever write about Karbala was Abu Mikhnaf Lut ibn Yahya. And he wrote a book about Maqtal Hussein. And that book is the basis of all of the Shi'i narratives about what happened in Karbala. So the same guy, Abu Mikhnaf Lut ibn Yahya, whom we as Sunnis do not trust at all. I mean, for us, he is a kathab, and he is not, nothing. He's just nothing to do with history for us. He's just a uh, person who fabricates from his perspective. But he has a narration which is a clear-cut fabrication. We don't accept it at all. I'm only telling it to you so you know if you hear it, where does it come from? According to him, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah refused to pray in the jama'ah, pray behind Abu Bakr, refused to go for hajj, Refuse to participate in anything. And this is clear-cut fabrication. In our Sunni sources, we find minor disapproval. For example, he says, you guys force me. And then the response is, to force you to, to join is better than letting you go. This is, you know, it's within the acceptable parameters. Okay, And some have said even this is not uh, there. And there are other references, and this is from our own Sunni tradition. So I'm just telling you to, so you know. There are also references that when Abu Bakr passed away, then Umar became the Khalifa. So again, Sa'ad felt that maybe it was more deserving. And so eventually he decided to leave Medina. Rather than cause a fitna or whatnot, he just decided to go and live a separate life. And this is one interpretation. The other interpretation is he went for jihad and he died uh, outside of Medina because of jihad. In any case, the point is that Sa'ad ibn Ubadah uh, does not really have much of a mention after this incident. He does pass away uh, in the conquered Sham area. He goes and he dies in Sham. And there are also, by the way, legends of Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, which is one of the most bizarre legends of our traditions. Uh, and these are legends. These are not a hadith. These are not authentic narrations. These are simply found in the books that the jinn killed Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Okay, this is a famous thing that who amongst the Sahaba was killed by the jinn? And this is a quiz question asked many times. Uh, and the response is Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Because he was discovered uh, in his house basically with an arrow. And they say a voice was heard that the jinn were boasting that we have killed Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. Uh, this is one of those bizarre things. As we said, it's a legend. And uh, I don't see the need to, if it happened, it happened. If it didn't happen, it didn't happen. Our religion is not based upon this. And Allah Azza wa Jal uh, knows best. Uh, in any case, uh, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah passed away within two, three years in the 14th year of the Hijrah. Or some say the early part of the 15th year of the Hijrah. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah passes away. Also, before we move on very quickly, uh, inshallah, we'll finish in around five minutes. Before we move on as well, I mentioned that Abu Bakr quoted a hadith that the Khalifa will be from the Quraysh. This command from the Prophet Wasallam is in fact mutawatir, i.e. dozens of a hadith reported. And we find reports in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, every single book of hadith. So much so Ibn Hajar says, I found over 40 narrations of different wordings, all of which mention Al-A'immatu min Quraysh. Or anasu taba'an li Quraysh fi had al amr. Basically, uh, so many a hadith that mention the leaders of my ummah must be from the Quraysh. Now, this this hadith and these commands always raise a lot of eyebrows in many Muslims, and they say, "What? Why?" And the response to this is, "Well, frankly, maybe we can't answer why." The Prophet said it. End of story. That's really the best way to say that. Okay, khalas. The Prophet said it. Uh, and some scholars have given reasons why. But in, in any case, the sheer quantity of a hadith in this regard, one cannot negate them. And therefore, Sunni and Shi'i Islam, one of the things we actually agree about, is that Al-A'immatu min Quraysh. Except that the Shia say not just any Qurashi, only Al al Bayt. But the Sunni say any Qurashi. Any Qurashi. The only people who opposed this were the Khawarij and the Mu'tazila. As for Ahl Sunnah and even the Shia, they said the leaders have to be from the tribe of Quraysh. As for the Shia, they said not only from Quraysh, but from only from Al-Bayt. Okay? So from our perspective, 
Uh, and this is something all of those who wrote in Islamic political science, like Al-Mawardi and like others of the classical tradition, Al-Baqillani, who has a little section about political science in his Aqidah book. So all of these great authors, they all mentioned, Ibn Hajar, they all mention that our leaders uh, should be from the Quraysh. And of course, for the bulk of our ummah, that has been the case. The Umayyads are Qurashi, the Abbasids are Qurashi. It was only in the time of the Ottomans where this was uh, taken away. Uh, and uh, it, there's another question, what if he's not from the Quraysh, does that negate his caliphate? Or does it simply mean his caliphate is missing something but it doesn't negate it? The majority of people said it doesn't negate his caliphate. Uh, so the Ottoman caliphate is valid, but it's better to have that if, we, if you had the option to choose, then you should choose the uh, person who has this noble lineage. In any case, frankly, uh, there's no explanation other than the process and commanded it, and so uh, be it. And then we conclude with uh, what happened on the next day, and that is on the Tuesday, on the 13th of Rabi'ul Awwal. So, on the Monday, within hours of the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Abu Bakr has now been decided amongst the senior Muhajirun and amongst the senior Ansar. He has been decided. And this shows us the severity of the matter. That barely a few hours after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, the Sahaba have decided who shall be their leader. And now the news spreads and the people are told, come and show up on Tuesday to give your bay'ah to Abu Bakr as siddiq So, after the morning prayer on Tuesday, so barely 24 hours after the death of the Prophet Wasallam, the Sahaba gathered in the masjid and the Prophet's body is still in the house of Aisha. He has not yet been buried. He has not yet been buried. And Abu Bakr comes and sits on the mimbar and this is uh, most likely before Salat al-Dhuhr. Most likely before Salat al-Dhuhr. So the people have come in the daytime and they're waiting there and Umar stands up and he introduces Abu Bakr and he basically says that, O oh people, uh, what I said yesterday was something from me. Neither did I find it in the book of Allah, nor did the Prophet tell me about it. Anybody remember what did he say yesterday? So what did Umar say? So what did Umar say? Where did the Prophet go? He's not, dead. He's, He's not dead. He's speaking with Allah. He's going to come back. Okay. So now Umar wants to make up for what he said yesterday. Notice now. So he says, what I said yesterday, this is not something that I heard from the Prophet ﷺ, nor is it found in the Quran. I made a mistake basically. That's what he's trying to say. Okay. That don't think that, you know, it was basically from me. And he said, I thought that the Prophet ﷺ would not leave us until everything was over and he would be the last of us to go. Meaning we'd all die before him. This is what he's thought. So Umar is saying, I thought we would all be gone before him. It never occurred to me he would die before us. But Allah has left you with his book and in it is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So hold on to it and you shall be guided. And Allah has gathered your affairs and chosen the best of you, the Sahibu Rasulillah, the Thani Athnaini Idhuma Fil Ghar, that is Abu Bakr as Siddiq. So stand up and give bay'ah to Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And therefore, everybody stood in line and gave the oath of allegiance to Abu Bakr as Siddiq, one after the other, until when everybody was done, Abu Bakr then stood up and he gave that three sentence khutbah which is one of the most powerful khutbahs ever given. In fact, no, I should say it is the most powerful khutbah ever given by any political leader after the Prophet ﷺ. And all of us have heard it on and off here and there. It's just three lines and it's something very beautiful. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq said, O people, I have been put in charge of you even though I am not the best of you. So if I do good, then help me. And if I do bad, then correct me. Being truthful is the essence of trustworthiness, and lying is treachery. And the weak amongst you is strong in my eyes until I return to him his right. Meaning the weakest amongst you are the closest to me. Until whatever he needs, he gets it. And the strongest amongst you is of least significance to me, is the weakest in my eye. In other words, don't be fooled by who's weak and strong. For me, 
The weakest amongst you have the most power for my time and attention. And the strongest amongst you are the ones who don't need anything from me until I take their right from them for the poor. And never does a group leave striving for the sake of Allah except that Allah strikes them with humiliation. And never does fahisha, lewdness and evil spread, except that Allah envelops them with his punishment. Obey me as long as I obey Allah and His Messenger. But if I disobey Allah and His Messenger, then I have no right on you that you should obey me. That was his khutbah. Then he said, stand up and pray. May Allah Azza wa Jal have mercy on you. That was the first khutbah of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And after he gave this khutbah, that was when the body of the Prophet now being washed and prepared for burial. After this, the discussion began where he should be buried. We talked about that already. After this, the people began to pray. We talked about that already. So all of the khilafah issues have already been done. Within less than a day, everything is settled and the matter has been decided and the people continue to pray, continue to pray upon the Prophet's body until finally they, they began after Dhuhr of Tuesday. And the sheer quantity of people continues. Now the goal was to bury him that day. But the sheer quantity of people kept on, kept on, kept on until they were forced to bury him late, late night. We don't know exactly when, but Wednesday had come. Wednesday had come. Does this mean he was buried at Isha time at 12 o'clock? We don't know. But late night, we would say Tuesday, which in the Muslim calendar is early Wednesday, right? Late night Tuesday was when the Prophet was buried. And that is, of course, early Wednesday from the Islamic uh, perspective. That, and of course, he's buried in his house, so you don't go, there, there's no going out. He's buried right then and there. And uh, with this, we conclude uh, the story of the election of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu. And inshallah ta'ala, uh, we will uh, continue, inshallah, our series about the Sahaba and Ummahat al inshallah ta'ala, next Wednesday. One quick question, we don't want to... That was the one thing I was trying to avoid this entire. Um, this does not have a simplistic response. And I am debating whether I should do this next Wednesday or not. <laughs> the problem comes. So let me, let me tell you. Uh, a lot of you have been wanting me to do the, the, the Khulafa al-Rashidun. And I have not said yes. In fact, I am saying no. For one simple reason, well, multiple, but for one reason, and that is that when we talk about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we have no problems reading everything in perfectly for him, because he is Rasulullah sallallahu Whatever he did, khalas, he did it. He is, he is Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But the Sahaba are not the prophets, and the Sahaba are very human. And you already notice in today's lecture certain things here and there that perhaps to gloss over it might even be better. And the Sahaba did have minor issues amongst themselves and minor disputes, which is human nature. And here's the point. We don't have to agree with every ijtihad of every Sahabi. Whereas we do have to agree with every ijtihad of the Prophet So when you talk about the Sahaba, and then you talk about what happened in their time, and then especially, especially Uthman, and then especially Ali radiallahu anhu's time. And you talk about Safin, and you talk about the battle of Jamal. Wallahi, this causes doubts in the minds of the average Muslim. And the fact of the matter is, nobody discusses these matters except that your heart becomes hard rather than soft. And it is better for the bulk of the ummah to really not know too much about what's going on. Not every knowledge is beneficial. Not every knowledge is beneficial. These were times of fitna. Things happened. Things were said. People lost their lives. People whom we admire and respect were fighting on both sides of the spectrum. And we look up to the both of them. Ijtihad happened. Shaitan caused divisions to flare up. And... I do not know of any scholar who has talked about these matters except that he himself has gotten into trouble because you're never going to please everybody, right? And the people that he's speaking to as well, more questions are raised up. So my philosophy about this issue 
is the philosophy Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal who said when he was asked about this fitna between the Sahaba, he said, that was a time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved our swords from getting involved, i.e. we weren't alive at the time, so let us save our tongues from getting involved as well. Meaning, let's just be quiet about it. It happened, it happened, let's just things move on. Let me give you an example you will all understand. I know it's getting a little bit late. Let me give you an example in our, our own daily lives. You know, we all have our problems with our brothers, sisters, parents, wives, spouses, you know. We have issues, fights, spats. Things go on, alhamdulillah, pat things patch up. Is it wise to go back to a fight you had with your brother, your sister, your wife, and go over each and every detail? Think about it. Something happened five years ago. Now it's gone, alhamdulillah, you're now moving on. Is it wise to go back and say, oh, she said this, I said this, he said this. What's going to be gained? Wallahi is going to bring more painful memories. More. Khalas is gone, is gone. So for us, we respect the Sahaba more than we respect it. And it's better that we just let it go. It's better that we gloss it over and not go into the mind you say, he said this, she said that. And the other problem comes here is where the whole theological differences come between Sunni and Shia. And you are not going to please even, here's the problem, even within Sunni Islam, there's a spectrum. There's a spectrum. Especially when it comes to Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, right? That much is said between minor criticism, some even harsh criticism, some even more than this, right? Versus much praise and you're not going to please everybody here. And my position is the position of majority of Ahlul Sunnah, which is that Muawiyah radiallahu anhu is of the Sahaba, and he is of the minor Sahaba. He's not of the major Sahaba, but he is a Sahabi. And what that means is, we do not criticize any Sahabi. Even if we disagree with an ijtihad, we don't criticize his integrity. We think that he meant the best for the Ummah. And let it be. Let his ishtihad with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is radiallahu anhum wa radu'an. He's of those whom Allah is pleased with. Not to the level of the great ten, but he still made it as a sahabi. Young boy, young man when he was a sahabi, he was 18, 19, but he's a sahabi. And Allah azza wa will for him to be the founder of the, one of the greatest dynasties we have seen and that is the Umayyad dynasty. It is best to be quiet about any other issues. So I will not be talking about the sahaba in detail at least in terms of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali in that manner. But I'm still thinking about what we should be doing after Umar al-Mu'mineen. So let me think about that still. But inshallah ta'ala, we'll begin inshallah next Wednesday. You'll get an email what we decide uh, to do. Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. In any case, it is late inshallah. So let us stop for Salat al-Isha. Uh, and we'll continue next Wednesday inshallah. Bismillah.